My name is Lynn and I'll be chairing the meeting today. The topic is Who is Muhammad? And our two speakers, a Christian and a Muslim, both believe that Muhammad existed, but they understand him in quite different ways, as we shall see. So without further ado, let me begin by introducing the first speaker, Dr. Bernie Power. Bernie has lived most of his working life in Muslim-majority countries. He holds degrees in science, education, and theology. His doctorate is on comparative religion, comparing early Islamic and Christian texts. He travels to many Muslim and other countries in his teaching roles. Bernie believes that there are many misconceptions held by Muslims and Christians about each other. It is important that these misconceptions be understood and addressed. This can be done in an atmosphere of love and respect, but with full openness and honesty. Bernie is dedicated to that vision. Before I start, uh, the other day on Friday, uh, Adnan gave me uh, um, a coin as a gift, um, as a sign of friendship uh, um, for, uh, for, for here. And so I want to return a gift to him. I'm giving him a copy of my book. I'll tell you why I've given him this particular one later on, uh, but that's very important. Thank you. <laughs> So our topic today is who is Muhammad? I'll start with uh, the a comment on the sources that I'm going to use for my talk. Uh, the first one that we'll use is the Quran. According to Muslims, the Quran is the earliest Muslim document, but it's actually a poor source for information about Muhammad. It lacks details, um, uh, places, names, dates, contexts, anything about Muhammad's period. Muhammad, in fact, is named only four times in the whole of the Quran. The second, so we need to look elsewhere for details about Muhammad. The second source I'm going to use is the, the first full biography or seerah of Muhammad, which is written by a guy called Ibn Ishaq, who died 135 years after Muhammad. And it, it was edited by Ibn Hisham, who died 200 years after Muhammad. We don't have the copies of the original Ishaq's book, only Ibn Hisham's censored redaction of it. I'll be referring to the hadith compiled by uh, al-Bukhari and, and Muslim, and these were written 220, 240 years after Muhammad died. And my fourth source is the um, Tabri's Tariq, or history, and he died nearly 300 years after Muhammad. These are quite late sources uh, from a historical perspective. They're the best ones that we have, but w this isn't uh, relating to the sources. I'm assuming that these documents are an accurate history of the uh, of the life of Muhammad. I've written three books which strongly feature Muhammad. Uh, the first one called Understanding Isla uh, Jesus and Muhammad seeks to maintain a balance between the two personalities between Jesus and Muhammad. The second one, is the one I gave Adnan, is called Engaging Islamic Traditions, is very affirming of Muhammad. It has a chapter called Positive Aspects of Muhammad's Life, 25 pages long. Another one called po uh, The Positive Treatment and Depiction of Women, 12 pages long. It presents a very optimistic view about Muhammad. The third one, called Challenging Islamic Traditions, is more critical of Muhammad. And Adnan, I'm sure, will give a, um, a more positive perspective on Muhammad's life than I'm going to give. But today I'll be drawing from the first and the third books. My intention is not to insult anyone or to upset anyone, but only to inform you about uh, what the earliest documents have told us. And if I fail, um, I apologise in advance. Let's go through with some history. Muhammad, according to Muslims, was born in Mecca in about 570 AD. His father, Abdullah, died before he was born. His mother's name was Amina, and she died when he was six years old. So he was an orphan from, uh, from childhood. He was brought up by his uncle, Abu Talib. As a child, he worked as a, a farmer, uh, sorry, as a shepherd, and later became a trader, leading camel caravans from Mecca up to Damascus. He had a good reputation, and he was called El Amin, the faithful one, or the reliable or honest one. At age 22, sorry, at age 25, he was proposed to by Khadija. Now, she was 40 years old, and the age gap was enough in Arab culture at that time for her to be his mother. She had been married twice before. She was wealthy and powerful. In fact, she owned the international trading company that Muhammad worked for. So Muhammad married the boss. He didn't have to work anymore, so he went on a spiritual quest. Um, 
the Arabs at that time were uh, idol worshippers, um, uh, and they worshipped at the uh, the black shrine called the Kaaba, in, which is in the centre of Mecca. It's still there today. At that time, it housed 360 idols in and around. It was a bit like the Greek pantheon. The the Arabs were a polytheistic uh, people, but Muhammad wasn't happy with this and he took to fasting in Ramadan and meditating in a cave outside Mecca on Mount Hira. Here's a picture of it. It was a pagan custom called Tahanath. And one night when he was about 40 years old, he was asleep in the cave and a being appeared in his dream and showed him a piece of fabric with some writing written on it. And this being ordered Muhammad to do something he couldn't do to read. Muhammad was illiterate. And the being kept ordering him to, do it, to read and grabbed him and squeezed him so tightly that Muhammad thought he was going to die, to suffocate from this. The being then recited the verse that was written on the fabric and Muhammad repeated it after him. And you can see it up there. The first passage of the Quran was revealed to Muhammad. And then Muhammad woke up from this. What was a pretty scary nightmare? He thought that he had encountered a demon and he ran screaming to his wife saying, cover me, cover me. And she did. Uh, Khadija wrapped him up in a blanket, left him shivering there. And she went to visit her cousin, a man named Waraka bin Nafal, who was a Christian and told him about what Muhammad had told her. And uh, Waraka said, that being was an angel. It wasn't a demon. And then Waraka died a few days later. No more revelations came for another three years. And Muhammad became very depressed. And Khadija said to him, I think your Lord must have come to, <clears throat> must have come to hate you. Muhammad tried to commit suicide by throwing himself off a high mountain. But the being then reappeared in front of him and identified himself as the angel Gabriel. And so Muhammad was reassured that time. But several other times he went and uh, attempted to commit suicide. Initially, Muhammad only told family and friends um, about his dream, and eventually he was threatened with violence by Allah if he didn't start to preach publicly. And so he went out into the uh, streets of Mecca and started preaching, telling people publicly what he had seen and heard. Well, it didn't go too well. Um, for 12 years, from 610 to 622, Muhammad presented the message of Islam as a peaceful preacher. He told the Meccans to turn away from their false idols and to worship only Allah, the Arab high God. So the Arabs already knew about Allah. The result was only about 200 followers out of a city of estimated population of 30,000. So only about 1% of the population chose to follow him. And there was a lot of persecution, both for Muhammad himself, but also for his followers. Some were, some were killed. In 621, he received, so by this time he's 51 years old, he's received an invitation from some people in Yathrib, a city to the north, which was later renamed Medina. And the following year, he left Mecca in a migration called the Hijra, and the, the Muslims left with him, and they settled in this new city. Whereas Muhammad had been peaceful in Mecca, he now received a new revelation from Allah that he could use violence to wreak vengeance on the, on the Meccans, to gain wealth and also to spread Islam. Once he had settled in Medina, he had political power and he had military capabilities. And so he used them both. He sent his troops out on, uh, he went out on uh, 28 military campaigns himself called uh, Ghazwa and then ordered his troops to take part in another 50 others called Asariya. So on average, there was an Islamic attack somewhere on the Arabian Peninsula every six weeks or so in the last 10 years of Muhammad's life. He engaged in this until his death in 632 AD when he died at age 62 or 63. He's buried in Medina and his grave is still there today. So readers of the Quran are told, you have a good example in God's messenger. And he presented himself as the best one to follow. He said, by Allah, I fear, I fear Allah more than you do. I'm more obedient to him than you. It's, he said, he who does not follow my tradition in religion is not from me, not one of my followers. He said, what is wrong with such people as refrain from doing a thing I do? By Allah, I know, I know Allah better than they, and I am more afraid of him than they. So he puts himself out there as the best model for someone following Allah. He also presented himself as preeminent in the world, the universal prophet. 
He said, every nation used to be sent to his nation only, but I have been sent to all mankind. He claimed absolute geographical sovereignty. He said, the earth belongs to Allah and to his apostle. He thought this gave him universal responsibility. He said, Allah has trust, trusted all the people of the earth to me. So clearly Muhammad uh, thought of himself and, and is described as the best example of humanity and as the final prophet for the whole world. It won't come as a surprise to you that I don't believe either of those claims. I've been studying Islam for over 40 years and I would have become a Muslim many years ago if I believed this. I've lived in Muslim countries. I've uh, seen and faced Islam. And based on what I'm going to say now, you'll understand why I haven't made that decision. We're going to look at 10 aspects of Muhammad's life and these raise serious questions about him and they're listed there. His moral character, his military history, his treatment of enemies, his involvement with slavery, his treatment of women and children and the handicapped, what he said on his deathbed, his final destiny and his inability to save anyone. Some Muslims claim that Muhammad was a perfect human being, but he was actually quite open about his own faults. He said, I seek forgiveness from Allah a hundred times a day. Al-Bukhari, he says, 70 times a day. And he wasn't just being humble because the Quran tells us, tells in, in the Quran, Allah tells him five times, seek forgiveness for your sin. So, istaghfar li dhanbika. It's your personal sin. And Muhammad responded um, by praying, O oh Allah, forgive me my sins, what that I did in the past or will do in the future, the things I did in secret or in public. So he has all the bases covered there. Muhammad is, it's clear from these passages that Muhammad never was and never claimed to be sinless. He needed God's forgiveness just like you and I do. An imperfect person cannot be a perfect model for all humanity. And all of this information, by the way, we've got to stand up the back with the brochures on it. It's written up in my books, or you can get it from my website. Everything is referenced from the earliest Islamic sources. Muhammad lived in violent times. As his troops attacked village after village, as I mentioned before, they pillaged the wealth, taking gold and silver and camels and sheep as booty. And here's a list of the military campaigns that Muhammad was, actually can't see it very well, that Muhammad was involved in, uh, but there's sources for those. Um, his followers killed and enslaved and mistreated many of those they captured. As an example, in the town of Khaybar, uh, a Jewish man named Kanana bin Arabiya was the keeper of the town's treasure. And Muhammad gave orders about, about him saying, torture him until you root out and extract what he has, that is, where the treasure is hidden. And so Zubair kindled a fire on Kanana's chest, twirling it with his fire stick until Kanana was near death. And then the messenger gave him to Maslama, who beheaded him. That night, Muhammad had sexual relations with Kanana's wid widow, Sophia, and he said, I have been made victorious through terror. So there's details there about Muhammad's sayings about uh, jihad as well. When people tried to oppose Muhammad because of his violent actions and his claim to be a prophet, he often treated them badly. An example, Asma, the, the daughter of Marwan, was the mother of small, five small children. She had composed a poem against Muhammad and he stood up in the mosque and said, who will rid me of Marwan's daughter? And Umair bin Uday al got, uh, went to her house that night when she was asleep and he removed the infant from her breast and stabbed her to death. And then he reported this to Muhammad who said, you have helped Allah and his apostle. Asma was just one of many and the list is there on the right-hand side, of uh, people that Muhammad um, ordered to be killed for opposing him. There were many who were taken out by his death squads. All of this, again, recorded in Islamic sources. In Medina, for example, every Jew that was there when Muhammad arrived was either expelled, enslaved, or executed within five years of Muhammad arriving in the city. Slavery was widely practiced amongst the Arabs. The, the Quran taught that freeing slaves was a virtuous act. And, um, but, and Muhammad did free his slave, Zayd bin Haritha, and actually adopted him as a son because Muhammad's sons had died as babies. He had no heir. And this was before Muhammad became a prophet. After he became a prophet at age 40, he continued to acquire slaves, up to 40 of them, and we have the names of them listed there. His men uh, captured many more and thousands were enslaved because of Muhammad. 
We see there he also sold slaves for other people and he, he ordered some of his female slaves to be flogged. Child marriage was apparently acceptable in, in Muhammad's time and he practiced it. In Medina, he took Aisha, the daughter of his best, best friend, and it said the prophet married her when she was six years old and he consummated this marriage when she was nine years old. And again, we've got earliest sources and the most reliable sources giving the uh, testing to those dates. And the question is, is a 54-year-old man having sexual relations with a nine-year-old girl a perfect model for humanity? Muhammad also married 10 other women, although some Muslim scholars give a higher figure. And he was involved in violence against them. One night, Aisha, who by this time was a teenager, she, uh, he died when she was 18, uh, went outside the house without his permission. And she reported that when she came back, he struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. He ordered that other women be killed. A man accused his wife of adultery to Muhammad and Muhammad said to one of his followers, go to the wife of this man and if she confesses, stone her to death. And then Unais went that, uh, to that woman the next morning. She confessed and Muhammad ordered her to be stoned to death. These are just samples. There's many more that I could have drawn for this. Although Muhammad could be brave in battle, at other times he lacked courage and compassion. He advised his followers to run away from a leper as one runs away from a lion. He married a Kindite woman named Asma bint Norman, um, but discovered on the wedding night that she was suffering from leprosy, so he divorced her immediately. A more compassionate response might have been to keep the wedding promise for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, and to care for this unfortunate woman in his own household. He already had 10 other wives. In the Quran, Muhammad is rebuked by Allah for frowning at and turning away from a blind man, Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum, uh, who had come to him seeking spiritual guidance. Muhammad was more interested in attending to a wealthy and powerful man. And so he didn't always show compassion to the disabled. Muhammad died lying in the lap of his favorite wife, Aisha. And at the, the last moment, Muhammad said, May Allah curse the Jews and the Christians, for they built places of worship at the graves of their prophets. This was just one of many instances uh, of Muhammad cursing people. And I've got a whole list there. There's dozens of them that you can see. These are all reported by Sahih al-Bukhari. Unfortunately, this would seem to disqualify Muhammad from being an intercessor or mediator at the, on the final, ju final judgment. Abu Dharda reported, the messenger of Allah said, peace and blessings be upon those who, curse, those who curse others will not be intercessors or witnesses on the day of resurrection. And some Muslims hold out the hope that Allah will intercede for them on the day of judgment, but based on Muhammad's actions and his own words, he's not qualified to do that. There was something else that Muhammad experienced on his deathbed which raised questions about him. There's a verse in the Quran which says, and if Allah, sorry, if Muhammad had forged a false saying against us, that is Allah, we would certainly have cut off his aorta and you could not have stopped us or withheld us from punishing him. Some people think that this prophecy was fulfilled on Muhammad's deathbed. He, uh, um, Aisha reported that um, he used to say, Oh, Aisha, I feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Khaybar. And at this time, I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. The poison was from a Jewish woman who gave that to him because um, he had killed her family. Whether you believe with this connection or not, it's clear that Muhammad had no certainty about where he would end up. He said, I don't know what's going to happen to me or to you. The Q, by the way, stands for Quran. He said, by Allah, even though I'm the apostle of Allah, I don't know what Allah will do to me nor to you. He said, the good deeds of any person will not save anyone. Um, they, they said, not even you, O Allah's apostle. He was supposed to be the best person who's ever lived. And he said, not even myself, unless Allah bestows his uh, favor and mercy on me. So Muhammad, despite all his achievements and qualities, was never certain that he would go to paradise. So it's not surprising then that he could offer uh, help that he could not offer help to anyone else. He gave the following advice to his family and his followers. O people of, of Quraysh, that is his own tribe, 
buy or save yourselves from the hellfire, as I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. O Bani Abdul Manaf, his own clan, I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. O Safiya, the art of uh, the aunt of Allah's apostle, I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. O Fatima, my own daughter. Ask for me anything you want of my wealth, but I cannot save you from Allah's punishment. So to conclude, it should be obvious why I don't think Muhammad is the best model for humanity to follow. He was conscious of his own flaws and shortcomings. If he thought he was more obedient to God than anyone else, he was clearly lacking in discernment, so he could not be a prophet. He wasn't the worst person to ever work, walk on the earth, but based on his own sayings, based on his actions, and the reports that we have of the earliest Islamic records, records he was clearly not the best person. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. And now uh, we have the opportunity to hear from Mr. Adnan Rashid. He's a historian with a specialty in the history of Islamic civilization, comparative religion, and hadith sciences. He has an honours degree in history from the University of London and is currently pursuing further studies. He takes a keen interest in Islamic numismatics, ancient manuscripts and antiquities. He is presently serving as a khatib at a West London mosque where he is conducting an, an extensive course on the tafsir of the Quran. Adnan believes that Islam is a way of life which promotes modernity in all of its positive manifestations and provides practically realistic solutions for all problems of mankind. Mr. Anan Rashid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the beneficent, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, and the God of Muhammad. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending today's debate. I thought Bernie was almost going to become Muslim today. For the first 10 minutes when he was speaking, I was thinking, wow, I couldn't defend the prophet like that. But the last 10 minutes, I was completely blown away with a lot of misinformation and outright lies, as we will see in due course. So to begin with, I would like to um, advise my Christian brothers and sisters here to never take information uh, from inauthentic sources. Always authenticate sources before you start to believe them. And what are the inauthentic uh, sources um, of sources, right? Number one, internet. Never believe anything you read on the internet. Go and check it. Check it against the actual language, the Arabic language, the original, where the text is coming from. Number two, never believe a Christian missionary talking about the Prophet of Islam because they have nothing good to say most of the times. Never believe an extremist atheist, uh, a neo-atheist, who hates the Prophet by the virtue that he preached to worship one God. So some of these people cannot be believed. And we will see in due course why I say that. I have a presentation I want to uh, present in front of you. But before I do that, I will quickly pick on some of the points raised by Bernie. Quran is a poor source, he said, of Prophet Muhammad's life. That's very inconsistent of Bernie to say that because the New Testament is a very poor source on Jesus Christ. What do we find in the New Testament about Jesus? Nothing, virtually nothing apart from his ministry. And uh, fragmentary information here and there. Do we find where he was, uh, how he was born or where he lived for the first 30 years of his life? Where, where is the information about the first 30 years of his life? Even his genealogy we are given in two Gospels is not consistent with each other. There are heavy problems with the biography of Jesus Christ. Even the crucifixion. The, the narrative of the four Gospels differs heavily even on the crucifixion when we go to the details. So if anything, the New Testament is a poor source on the life of Jesus Christ, not the Quran. The Quran never came down as a biography of the Prophet of Islam in the first place. The Quran never claims to be a biography. So to expect the Quran to give you a biography of the Prophet is quite telling. Sirah. Zero literature which Bernie put up those four sources in front of you, the Quran, and then he put number two was Ibn Ishaq for some reason. I don't know where Bernie got that from. Bernie claims to have studied Islam for years. He should have known that. Even a primary level student of Islam knows that Ibn Ishaq is not an authentic source of Islam. If anything, uh, a Christian equivalent would be an apocryphal, apocryphal gospel. Do you believe in gospel of uh, Judah, for example? Do you accept the gospel of Thomas as a valid source of information on the life of Jesus Christ? Do you accept the gospel of Mary Magdalene and Nag Hammadi scriptures and all these documents attributed to Jesus Christ in the first three centuries? You don't. 
Likewise, we have a consistent view on our sources. The Quran is number one, and uh, the Hadith literature, which Bernie picked on, but what Bernie did, he mixed up authentic information with inauthentic. A lot of the unpleasant stuff he read was from Ibn Ishaq for some reason. And um, most of that information is inauthentic. It is not acceptable. Uh, we don't accept it. It's, it's information. We cannot trace it back to the sources. We cannot trace it back. Just like the Christians reject all those apocryphal gospels, hundreds of them uh, attributed Jesus Christ. So we have to be very careful about uh, when information comes from some Christian missionaries. Waraka bin Nofal was a man who mentioned angels and demons. He told Muhammad that this was not a demon, it was an angel. There is nothing about a demon in that report. So to put a spin on the report, to caricature the report in a way that it sounds very uh, kind of mysterious, that there was a demon or there was, a, there was an angel. Waraka never mentioned uh, a demon. Rather, he said to Muhammad, هَذَا النَّامُوسِ أَلَّذِي نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى مُوسَى this is the Arabic language. This is the same angel that came upon Moses. And he told Muhammad that this is foretold in the previous scriptures because I'm a man of scriptures. So he was referring to the book of Isaiah chapter 29 verse 12 where it's clearly stated when the book is given to the one who is not learned and it is said to him, read, he will say, I am not learned. This is exactly what happened to Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the cave. The angel appeared to him, said to him, read, and he said, I am not learned. This is a prophecy fulfilled in him, a biblical prophecy, which Waraka confirmed. And Waraka died a Muslim, having believed in the prophet of Islam, which is another matter altogether. Bernie said he has studied Islam for the last 30, 40 years, and he is not a Muslim. Uh, I can give you example of uh, Jewish scholars. Giza Vermes, he is an academic. He has published heavy works on the Bible. Uh, he has published commentaries, biographies of the life of Jesus Christ. Giza Vermes, he is a Jewish scholar who has studied Christianity for 50 years, more than you have. And he is not a Christian. He didn't accept Christianity. So what does that mean? I have studied Islam for 30 years. I have studied Christianity for 20 years. The best part of my life. I'm not a Christian. I'm a Muslim. I'm a very firm Muslim who believes in Islam. This proves nothing. These are cheap shots, by the way. By the way, my tone, please do excuse me. Um, this is a debate. Uh, me and Bernie, we will hug each other afterwards. And I'll potentially kiss him on his cheek as well, you know, to express my love. But my respect and honor for my prophet outweighs my love for Bernie. I hope you understand that. So I love you all, my Christian brothers and sisters. The reason we are going through this exercise to share my love to you and my love requires that I give you authentic, right, correct information about our prophet. So you can think about it. You can go and read about him and see whether what I tell you is true. When Bernie po uh, pasted that uh, word or that um, verse from the Quran, Astaghfar li dhambika, in the Quran, God talks to prophet of Islam directly. And the reference uh, is to his people. So God is talking to the prophet so that the message reaches his people. When God tells him that seek forgiveness for your sins, he's talking to the Muslims. Because we have so many reports, as we will see in due course, where the prophet was completely free of sin. We were told that he was forgiven, he was guaranteed paradise. Bernie claimed that he was not certain about his end. How can he not be certain about his end? And he's telling his companions, you are promised paradise. He told his companions, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abu, Abu Abayda bin Jarrah, and uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, and the list goes on and on and on. He told them, you are guaranteed paradise. You will be in paradise. You will have salvation. How can he be telling people when he doesn't know where he's going? He had confirmed information of God Almighty. He was a true prophet of God. He received this revelation that he is forgiven. He is in paradise. He's guaranteed paradise. So I don't know why Christian missionaries keep coming up with this idea that the Prophet of Islam had no certainty of his end. Then Bernie mentioned torture. Torture. And if you look at the source, it's Ibn Ishaq. There is no authentic report about the Prophet of Islam. And this is the reason why we're proud of his legacy. Torture is absolutely forbidden in Islam. It is haram. It is prohibited. Muslims cannot indulge in torture. We cannot. And the report he read was, again, a dubious, a forgery, um, a completely, uh, you know, um, 
inauthentic information which Bernie came up with for some reason. I challenge Bernie to produce a reference on torture from one of our authentic sources. We have six authentic books of hadith. They contain 34,000 reports about the Prophet of Islam. Produce one report on torture. He jumps to Ibn Ishaq, which is very, very disturbing. And if you want to talk about torture and barbarity and wars and destruction and getting married to younger women and all that, have you read the Bible, Bernie? Have you read the Bible? I'm sure Bernie has read the Bible very carefully. And the same Bible on Bernie's table there. When you read the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16 states, All scripture is God-breathed. It is good for correction, righteousness, and teaching. In other words, all scripture, and Paul is specifically talking about in this particular passage about the Old Testament. Because the New Testament is not even in existence. Paul was the first author of the New Testament according to most Christian scholars. He died in 60 CE. The first gospel is thought to have been written between 60 to 70 CE, the gospel of Mark. The New Testament doesn't even exist. So when Paul says all scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, what do we read? Moses tells the Israelites, go into the villages and the towns of the Amalekite people. Kill men, women, children, suckling infants, suckling infants and camel and ox. I ask this question. Men and women, of course, it's absolutely disgusting and disturbing why they have to be killed in war. But what have the ox done? What have the camels done? Right? So the Bible even commands to torture animals. There's nothing like that in Islam. Okay? I want to see Bernie come back and defend the Bible. And again, to point, point out something very clearly. Bernie, when he will launch one attack against the Prophet of Islam, albeit based upon dubious and inauthentic sources, I will throw tenfold back at him from the Old Testament, which is all scripture, good for righteousness, teaching, and morality. So, so this is the scripture, the Old Testament is good for all the good things for the Christians. The Christians have upheld the Old Testament throughout centuries, even after Jesus disappeared. You want to read the Christian history? There were people being burnt alive in the West, in Europe, and later on in the Americas. People being burnt alive. And where did the inspiration come from? The Bible, the book of Leviticus, chapter 20 and 21. You burn people alive. You burn people, right? The Christians were burning witches and heretics, scientists. Galileo nearly got, got burnt. Today you love Galileo, but at that time, Galileo was nearly burnt. There were people burnt at stake, hundreds of thousands of them. Inspiration came from the Bible. I can use all that and throw it at Bernie and ask him to defend it. I, I want to see how Bernie will actually defend that. So if all of that is good for teaching morality and righteousness, the, the, the Old Testament, all scripture, it is clearly stated by Paul, and you believe that, and you uphold that, you cannot reject that, if that's true, then on what basis do you attack the Prophet of Islam for being a ruler, for being a lawgiver? What basis do you use? You have an audacity. You have to be inconsistent and hypocritical to come and attack the Prophet of Islam like that when you have the Bible in your possession. You read it. It's on your table. The book of Numbers, chapter 31, verse 17 states, When you go into the villages, take young girls for yourselves. As slaves. And do what with them? I leave that for you to imagine. Moses commanded the Israelites, go. All scripture is good for righteousness, for teaching and morality. This is what the Bible states in the New Testament. Paul said that. All scripture means the, New Test Sorry, the Old Testament. So it is very clear now that Bernie played a very dangerous game today. With the life of the prophet and his impression in his image. There's a reason why some Christian missionaries have to do that. Uh, nowadays, Christian missionaries around the world, their focus is to drive people away from Islam. There is little preaching of the Gospels. There is no love of the Gospels with a lot of the Christian missionaries. I'm not, I'm not saying all, I'm saying a lot. When you watch some of the stuff online, you see a lot of hate against Muslims, a lot of hate against the Prophet of Islam. And the purpose is to drive, because Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Hundreds of thousands of people are coming to Islam 
in Africa, in South America, in far, far, East, far East Asia. Every single place you go to, people are coming to Islam. And the Christian missionaries don't know what to do. So they are doing this to drive people away from Islam so people uh, do not even consider Islam, let alone become Muslims. So slavery and females and all that, things, all those things were thrown at me from uh, Bernie. So it's very disturbing because all of that is in the Old Testament and it's good for teaching morality and righteousness. And if that's the case, you either come back and disown the Old Testament. Say, the Old Testament is barbaric, uncivilized, completely, we need to drain it. We need to flush it down the toilet. Come back and do that. If you don't do that, if you stand by the Old Testament and you consider it the word of God and good for righteousness, correction and... Uh, Morality, then come back and say Prophet Muhammad did exactly what he was supposed to be doing as a prophet of God, as a ruler appointed by God Almighty, just like Moses, David, and marriages. Look at their marriages. David, how many wives did he have? How many wives did Abraham have? How many wives did Solomon, a prophet of God in the Old Testament, how many wives did he have? And Jesus never condemned any of them. The Christian missionaries do today for some reason. Jesus never condemned any of them. He actually uh, upheld their legacy. <clears throat> then Bernie came up with a lot of this, uh, you know, an avalanche of misinformation. Aisha felt pain because Prophet struck her on the chest. If Bernie knows the Arabic language, I assume, I want to assume good about Bernie. Either Bernie is ignorant about our sources or he is disingenuous. I wouldn't like to uh, think the former. I would go for uh, sorry, the latter. I would go for the former. Bernie is ignorant, right? When you read the Arabic word in that report, it says falahada, which means to press. Christian missionaries have been at it for a very long time using this particular report that Prophet struck Aisha. He never struck anyone in his entire life. We will see in due course what I mean by that. Even his servants, even his servants, they testify to the fact that he was the most gentle person to walk the planet. He was the most loving and compassionate person to walk the planet, as we will see very quickly if I get time. Then Bernie mentioned stoning. Someone was brought and he ordered to stone. Well, it's there in the Old Testament. All scripture is good for righteousness, for teaching, for morality. This is very important for you, ladies and gentlemen. If all scripture is good for righteousness, for, mora for, for morality and for teaching, then it is there. It is the Jewish law in the book of Leviticus. If anything, the prophet of Islam is continuing the, the, the tradition, unlike the Christians who follow Paul, who was an imposter in our opinion. For some reason, the Christians have completely believed in Paul who is not foretold and prophet Muhammad who is directly foretold in the Old Testament. Uh, as we will see again later, he is directly foretold in clear words that there will be a prophet from Arabia. If he is not foretold, then where are references to him? He created one of the greatest civilizations in human history. Poets, universities, libraries, thinkers, intellectuals, scientists, uh, moral men, generals, kings, Jews and Christians flourished under the protection of Islam for over a thousand years. Jewish scholars to this day remember that age as the golden age of the house of Israel when they were protected by the Muslims for over a thousand years. Who, stay, who says so? Bernard Lewis in his book, the Jews of Islam. Mark Cohen, who's a Jewish historian from the US, he states that the Jews were treated far better in the Muslim world during the Middle Ages than they were treated in the Christian world. What happened to the Christians? Why were they persecuting the Jewish people? And that's another history we can discuss later. Blind man example, again, read the Old Testament as well as the New Testament carefully. Cursing Muhammad. Muhammad cursed many people. That's what Bernie said. Well, if you read the New Testament carefully, Bernie, you would never use that against the prophet of Islam. Jesus cursed a fig tree. He called the, the Pharisees vipers, adulterous, adulterous generations, you hypocrites. You called people dogs and pigs. Jesus used these words in the New Testament. He called them dogs and pigs. And you have an audacity to come and use the same point against the prophet of Islam. Please, Bernie, I love you. And I'll have, hug you later, okay, to demonstrate my love. So please do not take my tone uh, in a negative way. I'm very passionate about my prophet and my faith, and my passion is taking um, uh, hold of me. But at the same time, I have to show my love and compassion for the Christian community, and they have this right. They deserve to know who our prophet really is. They deserve to know. 
Then about poison and certainty of end and all that, I'm not going to indulge in that. I'm going to quickly get on to the next point. So if prophet of Islam is a true prophet of God, if he's true according to the Bible, why the Bible? Because the Christians believe in the Bible. Unfortunately, what the Christians do to prophet Muhammad today, what the Jews did to Jesus. When he came and preached to them and he said to them, I am the Messiah, the Jewish people rejected him. They made 101 excuses to reject him. No, you're not the Messiah, you're a sorcerer, you're a liar, you're a cheater, you're a magician, and they tried to kill him. And he was protected by God Almighty, as was discussed in the previous debate. Book, book of Psalm, Psalm 91 is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, and Bernie was wrong when he said it's not about Jesus Christ. All Christian scholars are unanimous that the, the book of Matthew chapter 4, when the prophecy is used by the devil, he knows why he's using it, because Jesus knows that this prophecy refers to him. He will be saved. Psalm 91 confirms that. So, we believe that Prophet Muhammad is a true prophet of God, not only according to the Quran, even according to the Bible. Bible tells us about an Arabian prophet. Firstly, in the time of Jesus, three prophets were expected. Three prophetic figures, three messianic figures. Uh, the Messiah, the Christ, who was distinct to the Elijah or Elias. And Elias was distinct to the, the, the prophet or that prophet. So when people came to John the Baptist, they asked him three questions. In the Gospel of John, as you can see the reference on the screen, that are you that prophet? Are you Elias? Are you the Christ? He denied all three charges. Then these are three distinct persons. Jesus confirmed that the Elias has, has already come. You did not recognize him. And I am the Christ. So who is that prophet? When you go to the Bible and check the reference, when you check the reference, what is this referring to? It refers to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, where Moses made a prophecy about a prophet like Moses will emerge okay, from the brethren of the Israelites. The brethren of the Israelites are the Ishmaelites, the Arabs. The Arabs. Well, many Christian missionaries, they have uh, an issue with that. They say, no, brethren means actually the Israelites. No, it means Edomites are called the brethren of Israelites in the Old Testament. The Edomites are not Israelites and they're called the brethren of the Israelites, for that, by that virtue, the Arabs, the Ishmaelites, are the brethren of um, the Israelites. And a prophet will arise from the brethren of the Israelites, Deuteronomy 18.18. Where is this prophet coming from? How was he like Moses? As you can see on the screen there, the likeliness of Moses and Muhammad, unlike Jesus. Because a lot of the Christians claim that that prophet was Jesus. But Jesus never claimed to be that prophet. He claimed to be the Christ. And there were three distinct persons, as we can see in this uh, breakdown, Three distinct persons. That prophet is still to come. He is still expected by the Jewish people and Jesus never claimed to be that. So who is that prophet? When we go to these passages, for example, Deuteronomy 33, 2, it mentions three locations. It mentions three locations. Number one is Sinai. Number two is Sire. Number three is Paran. Sinai is Egypt, Moses. Sire is Palestine, a mountain age in Palestine. That's Jesus. Where is Paran? Who is coming from Paran? Paran is Arabia, according to the Bible again. The book of Isaiah chapter 21 verse 13 clearly states that Kedar or Paran is Arabia. And Kedar was also in Arabia. And this is the diagram to explain uh, to, to you clearly um, where uh, Paran is. The remaining of my presentation will be given to you in my first rebuttal. Thank you so much for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. God bless you all. I've got 10 minutes to respond to all of the issues. Um, it's good to see some passion, isn't it? This is, this is serious stuff, and, and I'm happy for that. And at Naan, we're, we're quite happy to disagree very strongly, and we will remain friends at the end of this. I hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, first of all, I was uh, uh, disappointed but not surprised to see that Adnan brought up a whole lot of things that weren't related to the topic. So I brought along my Red Herrings Awards. Um, <laughs> all I could get was sardines from Coles, but Red Herrings. Um, so a couple of the things were um, the New Testament is a poor source of Jesus. We're talking about Muhammad, not about the New Testament. Um, the, uh, the Bible on torture, we're talking about Muhammad, not 
about the Bible on torture, not about the Bible at all. Christians burning others alive, not related to the topic. It's a red herring. Um, another one, the wives of David and Solomon, not related to the topic. It's, this is about Muhammad. Uh, another one, he brought up Paul. I was waiting for this one. Not related to Muhammad at all. Paul and Muhammad never met each other. And the last one, Psalm 91, not related. This was, uh, it's not a messianic psalm. Uh, the only person who quoted it as uh, relating to Jesus was the devil. So um, a bad one to, uh, to line up with. Um, so there's a couple of the red herrings uh, that, that came up today. And I'll pass those on to Adnan now. Um, and this will keep you in uh, sardines for the next few weeks. Yeah. Let's get to the real topics. The question he said, use only authentic sources. Um, and the one that he objected to was Ibn Ishaq. But actually... I'm not sure that he believes that because I do have here a video clip of him talking about Ibn Ishaq to a Muslim audience some time ago. Have a listen to what he says. Who is the, 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 the main historian we refer to for the life of the Prophet ﷺ? Anyone? The biography of the Prophet. Sorry? Yes, Ibn Hisham. But who, who wrote the book of Ibn Hisham? Ibn Hisham is an abridgment of an earlier work, Ibn Ishaq, Muhammad bin Ishaq, who was born in the year 80 Hijri and died in 150-51. Muhammad bin Ishaq. So we refer for the life of the Prophet to make sense of it in a chronological way to this history. So what I want to know is what new information about Ibn Ishaq has come up in the last few years that means it is now inauthentic because I'm quoting it, Muslim scholars quote it, Tabari quotes it, lots of other people do, and so did Adnan a few years oh, yeah. ago. Um, he talked about Secondly. whether um, Muhammad had seen a, um, a, whoops, a demon in the, um, in the cave, and uh, both Ibn Ishaq and Tabari, the uh, authentic um, historian, talk about um, uh, Khadija saying, rejoice because by God, the thing that you've seen is an angel and not a Satan. So these were the terms that came up in, in those early discussions. He talked about Muhammad promising paradise to others, but not himself. Well, he did. And I, I recognize that there were 10 people that he promised paradise to. But what do you do with these words of Muhammad? He also said, I don't know what's going to happen to me from the Quran. He also said in Al-Bukhari, I don't know what Allah will do to me. Uh, from El Bukhari, I, I don't know if I will enter enter paradise myself. These things, these were authentic sayings of Muhammad. We need to deal with them. Um, he said it was dangerous for me to criticize his view of Muhammad, but why was it not dangerous for you to criticize my view of Jesus on Friday night? What's going on here? We should have equality in that. Everybody should be equally free and equally open to express their views, even if other people don't find it comfortable. I sat there on Friday night. I heard him saying things about Jesus that to me were really quite offensive and wrong. Um, and I didn't think that was dangerous for him at all. Why is it dangerous for me? That's a big question. He says that... Um, um, Muhammad pressed Aisha, it says, on the chest, and she says, which caused me much pain. So this was seriously not just a little touch. This was a, a, a kind of an intimidatory kind of push on her chest that she experienced. He said that he thought that the Jews um, actually coped better under Islam. Not if you look at your history. The Pact of Umar in 717 said Christians, um, Christians and Jews had to wear a yellow seam on their garments in um, Persia in 807, they were ordered to wear a yellow belt. In Granada, in Islamic Spain, they had to wear a yellow badge. Hitler picked up the same kind of thing. This was something that continued on throughout history. The Jews did not do very well under Islamic rule. His details about the, uh, the Pact of Umar and all of the things that the Jews, uh, sorry, the Christians and Jews were not permitted to do. We're not permitted to teach the Quran to our children. We cannot manifest our religion publicly or convert uh, anyone to it. We cannot prevent any of our kin from entering Islam if they wish it. But people were not allowed to leave Islam and become Jews, not allowed to leave Islam and become Christians, which is still the case today. We were um, uh, not allowed to ride with saddles, not allowed to carry any kinds of weapons. They had to travel around unprotected. 
um, but the Muslims were allowed to carry weapons. So it was not an easy life for them, which is why Maimonides, probably the, the, the Jewish John Calvin or the um, um, uh, El Ghazali, uh, he lived in Spain under Islamic rule and he moved to Cairo because he would not adopt the Islamic faith. They gave him the choice, you either convert to Islam or you, um, uh, or you have to leave or we will execute you. And he said, stated afterwards, he said, the nation of Ishmael, that is the, Jew, the Muslims, persecute us severely and devise ways to harm us and debase us. No nation has done more harm to Israel. None has matched it. The more they choose... Um, the more we suffer and try to conciliate with them, the more they choose to act belligerently towards them. This was the um, testimony of a famous Jew who lived under Islamic rule. It was not a positive experience. He mentioned about a prophet who will come, um, who will be like me, um, and this is the the, the uh, verse in Deuteronomy 18, God will raise up a prophet for, uh, among you, a prophet like me from among your, uh, from among your brothers. Um, and Muslims say, well, this was a prophecy about Moses and they give a couple of different reasons for it. They might use a, uh, a scale like this one. Um, say, oh, well, look, there's some similarities between uh, Moses and Muhammad. And, uh, uh, and Adnan used a similar kind of list to those things that they had done. But actually, the same list applies to Alexander the Great. He did every one of those things as well. He had just as much claim. And the same with Napoleon. Every, every one of those things, both Napoleon and Alexander and Muhammad did. So it's not unique. There's no reason why Muhammad should claim that it's for himself. But if we have a look at how this compares with Jesus, we can see Jesus and Moses had more things in common than they had with Muhammad. All of these areas, Muhammad was not able to tick a single box on them. Jesus and Moses agreed on, on every one of them, and there's many more of these. In John 5, verse 46, Jesus referred that prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 to himself. He said, Moses spoke of me. And he said, everything that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Peter said, Jesus was the prophet like Moses. So Stephen referred to in Acts 17, in Acts 7. There's a consistent connection between the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 and the ministry of Jesus. It's made through a, in different, by different uh, people within the New Testament. But why didn't Muhammad obey Moses' law. Moses said, do not erect a sacred stone, for the, these the Lord your God hates. But what did Muhammad do with the black stone in Kaaba? Well, he was the one who um, had taken the stone and actually put it back into the Kaaba. It had been washed out in a flood, and Muhammad was the one who was responsible for re-cementing it in there, um, even though uh, God, through Moses, had said, do not worship black stones. So why didn't Muhammad do this? Uh, he continued to touch the sacred stone and kiss it and encourage people to do that. And if you go to, if you're a Muslim, you can go to Mecca today and you can do that. Uh, a prophet like Moses should, would not do such a thing. He doesn't qualify to be called a prophet like Moses. And he mentioned about Paran um, in Deuteronomy 33. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir. He went forth from Mount Paran. He talks about three visits: Sinai for Jesus, Seir for Jesus, uh, for sorry, Sinai for Moses, Seir for Jesus, and Paran in Arabia for Muhammad. But in fact, Paran and Seir are near Egypt in the in the uh, Sinai Peninsula. They're not in the place where he marked them on that map. Uh, we know the location of them. They're not near Palestine. They're not near Mecca. It was the Lord Yahweh who was coming in this prophecy. It wasn't someone else. It says, when the Lord Yahweh comes, he will go to these. He would come with a myriad of saints. He would not come with 10,000 or 30,000 soldiers as, as, Mos as uh, Muhammad did. But I will stop there. I've got a whole lot of this. Thank you. Now you have dug a deeper hole for yourself. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Bernie, for another uh, attempt to uh, defend your position attacking the Prophet of Islam. Uh, I again stated, I mean, I stated earlier, and I state again, that you cannot trust misinformation, inauthentic information, from sources who have clear bias against a noble man who created one of the greatest civilizations in human history. And 
the doings and the achievements of the Muslim civilization is a completely different matter altogether. Even the West, what we know as the Western civilization, is in debt to the Muslim civilization heavily, and books have been written on that topic. And if you have questions, you can raise that question. Red herrings, uh, thank you for that. When you put them together, they look a lot, don't they? Right? But every single point I made about the Old Testament was directly linked to your attacks against the Prophet of Islam. Everything you criticize the Prophet for, it is in your scripture, and your scripture is good for learning, preaching, and morality. If that's the case, on what basis, when you believe that, and I'm sure you believe that, and you cannot deny that, if that's the case, then on what basis do you attack the Prophet of Islam for doing far less uh, uh, severe things than what you find in the Old Testament? He was a ruler. He had to implement the law. He had to do things. Jesus, when he was walking around the temple, he was turning the tables over. He was cursing people. He was doing all these things. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, we see a parable where Jesus said, uh, bring my enemies hither and slay them in front, of, in front of me because they would rather not believe me. And the Christians would come back and say, no, that's a parable. But why is Jesus telling that parable is the question. What is the purpose of that parable? Jesus is the king. He's referring to himself. And when he returns... What will Jesus do? Can you tell us when you, when you come back? What will be the character of Jesus Christ when he returns? As he's foretold in the book of Revelation. What will he do? This is a very important question. Chronology of Ibn Ishaq. He played my, and I feel flat, flattered. Thank you very much for working hard and watching my videos. Watch more of them. And next time we can have a better informed debate. Uh, Ibn Ishaq, I only used him for a chronology. I, I have stated a number of times in my public lectures that Ibn Ishaq is not an authentic, authentic source on the life of the Prophet. Rather, it gives us a chronology and that's the value of Ibn Ishaq. The biography of the Prophet can be found in those 34,000 reports which Bernie failed to bring up when he made all these lavish and hostile claims. Bernie mentioned, the reason why I use the word dangerous uh, is because Bernie used some heavily politically loaded terms, terror. He used the word terror. He used the word death squads. And these words ring in our ears every single day when we watch the news. Terror, terror, terror. Death squads, death squads, death squads. Muslim death squads, Muslim terrorists. Even though most terrorists in the world are not Muslims. But that's what we hear on the news. And these are politically loaded terms Bernie used. That's something that's a dangerous thing. It inflates Islamophobia. It causes attacks like what happened in Christchurch. And believe you me, the Christchurch attacker was directly influenced by some Christian missionaries. I would not like to honor them by mentioning them. He was directly influenced by some Christian missionaries um, in the West, in the Western world. Okay, and they for some reason have an impunity to lie on Islam. Pact of Umar, Bernie mentioned Pact of Umar. Pact of Umar again is an inauthentic uh, information. There is not an authentic source of that pact. Rather, scholars who have studied it, such as Professor Thomas Arnold, if you want to actually go and look into this uh, issue, Professor Tom, uh, Thomas Arnold's book, Preaching of Islam, and there are other um, uh, scholars, such as Mark Cohen, who was mentioned earlier, they have commented on Pact of Umar. The Pact of Umar in its current form is not even authentic. It cannot be traced back to the, uh, to the Prophet, let alone Umar himself. What we do have, however, authentically narrated, which Bernie failed to notice in the book of Tabri, which he keeps referring to, uh, is the Pact of Umar in the book of Tabri, which is authentic, and it is the Treaty of Jerusalem between, between the Christians of Jerusalem and Muslims. And it, ladies and gentlemen, do me a favor. When you go home, please check on these things. The Treaty of Jerusalem between Omar and Patriarch Sophronius, the Patriarch of the city of Jerusalem. Read that treaty and tell me if it sounds anything like what Bernie read. There's a treaty between the Prophet of Islam and the Christians of Najran. Christians came to Medina. They had a discussion with the Prophet. They refused to believe in him. What did the Prophet do? Disappear? Take them into dungeons? Torture them? No. Go back to your lands. You may worship your God as you like. Live in your churches. And you will not be attacked or you will not be coerced in religious matters. The Treaty of Najran that can be found in the history of Imam Baladuri, Futuhul Buldan, the conquest of nations. Uh, and you can find the treaty, the exact text of treaty there. And there's a lot more. I can Islamic Spain and Maimonides and what he quoted from Maimonides was actually 
another misrepresentation. Maimonides escaped to Egypt. He's definitely right. Bernie's right. And I expect better from a PhD doctor. Someone who has a PhD uh, degree in uh, comparative religion who, who should be teaching me because I don't have a PhD yet. Uh, hopefully I will, do have, uh, uh, I will have one soon. Uh, he is supposed to know better, right? Okay. Uh, when he talks about Maimonides running to Egypt, what happened in Egypt to Maimonides? He was actually put on trial for apostatizing from Islam. And who defended him? The Muslims came to rescue him. They said, he's not an apostate. He's a Jew. He's a Jewish man who never accepted Islam. So he should not be on trial. Maimonides was the personal physician of the Sultan, Malik Afdal. Al-Malik Al-Afdal, the brother of Saladin, the famous Saladin. Maimonides was his personal physician. Now we come to the letter. The letter was written to the Yemeni Jews to dissuade them from Islam because they were considering coming to Islam and they sent certain Old Testament passages to Maimonides for his commentary. What do you think of these passages? Some of them mentioned today earlier that these passages referred to an Arabian prophet and we feel Muhammad was that prophet. What do you feel? Maimonides wrote to them completely misrepresenting the reality of his own existence. He was the, the physician to Sultan. And he's saying that we have been mistreated by these people. How can you be the physician to Sultan? Imagine if a Muslim came today living in Australia who has everything. He has, who has all the freedom. He's going to school. His children are going to school. He's, he has free education, uh, free, um, uh, you know, free education and free medical treatment and has a good job and living peacefully, nicely as Muslims do in Australia, thankfully. If a Muslim was to stand up and say, we have nothing here. We are being mistreated. The Australians are racist. They're Islamophobic. They hate us. They hate us. What would you feel about that? You wouldn't. Uh, that would be a misrepresentation of the reality. Because I have seen with my own eyes how Muslims live in Australia. Muslims are very happy. They are coexistent. Australian people are amazing people. They are great people. They are loving people. So anyone to misrepresent the reality like that, you should not quote them, Bernie. Alexander the Great. Again, a misrepresentation of my argument. Uh, Alexander the Great never claimed to be a prophet. Alexander the Great and Napoleon Bonaparte both of them never claimed to be a prophet. Muhammad did. And he referred back to the Old Testament. He said, I am actually mentioned. The Quran chapter 7 verse 157 clearly states that you will. They find Muhammad mentioned with them in the scriptures. They find him mentioned with them in the scriptures. And when we open the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah chapter 42. The entire chapter is telling us the coming of a messianic figure. Okay who will have certain qualities, and these are the qualities he will have. Look at that on the screen. Isaiah 42, the entire chapter tells us about the coming of this messianic figure, right? This is definitely not Jesus. And this is a messianic prophecy according to most biblical scholars. People like Doom, people like Christopher North, who wrote uh, a commentary on this particular part of the book of Isaiah for the University of Oxford. He stated this is a messianic figure, a prophet king who will come in the future. He will have these qualities. But there is something very unique about this prophecy. It mentions a location specifically. It mentions these qualities. He will bring a new law. He will bring judgment. He will be a chosen one. He will put idol worshippers to shame. He will come as a light for the Gentiles. Jesus said, I have not come for the Gentiles. I know Bernie will come back with the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 where Jesus is thought to have said, go into the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Spirit. That passage is actually a later interpola uh, interpolation according to some Christian scholars like Graham Stanton from the Cambridge University. Right? So if that's the case that Jesus said, I have not come for anyone but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, then who is this prophet who's coming as a light for the Gentiles? And Kedar, if you see verse number 11, Isaiah 42, Kedar is the second son of Ishmael, the direct ancestor of the prophet of Islam, prophet Muhammad. Same Ibn Ishaq, which was being quoted by Bernie so lavishly, uh, or so conveniently, uh, same Ibn Ishaq has a biography and a genealogy of Prophet Muhammad going back straight to Khaydar. Khaydar, according to the book of Genesis chapter 25 verse 13, was the second son of Ishmael. And if that's the case, this figure who is coming in the future with all these qualities has something to do with Khaydar. And the word Sela, where in Khaydar? Khaydar are the children of Ishmael, the Arabs. Okay, where, are, where is this person coming from? The Mount Sela. Mount Sela is the mountain of Medina. It is a mountain in Medina. You don't believe me? 
Google it now, right now, and you will see a Wikipedia page. Sela is the mountain, is a mountain in Medina. So if these are the specific prophecies we have about the Prophet of Islam, an Arabian prophet, why do the Christians do to Muhammad what the Jews did to Jesus Christ? Why do you reject him? Why do you reject him and attack him in ways uh, that cannot be sustained when we look at the sources? There's a lot more I can say, but the final point I want to say is, I love you, Bernie. Thank you very much to both our speakers for a very uh, spirited presentation. And thank you to all of you as well for submitting uh, the many questions that are coming in fast and furious. Just uh, to clarify again, we will prioritize the questions according to the topic, who is Muhammad? I know there are a lot of questions that come in that relate to related topics, but not directly. And because of time, we have to concentrate on um, or prioritize according to this. So the first uh, grouping of questions is for Mr. Adnan. Okay. Um, a lot, uh, a few have come in about uh, the topic of uh, violence, um, and they have quoted uh, various surahs uh, in the Quran, Surah 9-5, 929, 533, and 8-67, um, all which they feel um, talk a little bit about uh, violence. So the question is, did Muhammad ever kill anyone personally, or ask that someone be killed, or um, talk about violence against pagans and torture? Thank you for that question. Uh, a very good question. There are plenty of verses uh, in the Quran pertaining to war. War with enemy. War with people who are planning to annihilate you. Most of Muhammad's wars, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, most of his wars were defensive. He was attacked by his own tribe, the Quraysh. He was attacked by a coalition of the Jewish tribes uh, in, in, uh, living in, in, a, in a settlement called Khaybar. And he was attacked by the Romans. And that's where the context come in, comes in for 929. The Romans were threatening the Muslims. The Romans were planning to attack, to launch an attack. We have references in Sahih al-Bukhari. Bukhari, the most authentic source of Islam after the Quran. And I will stand by every single word in Bukhari. I accept it. There are 7,552 reports. Bring torture from there. Bring injustice from there. Bring anything you want to uh, with context. Do not put an uh, unpleasant spin on it. Quote it as it is and contextualize it. I'm sure you have done a PhD. You have read the context. And for that reason, I invite you to read biographies of the Prophet written by, for example, Karen Armstrong not a Muslim, read a biography written by Karen Armstrong, read a biography written by Martin Lynx, an Englishman who converted to Islam and he wrote a biography of the Prophet, read that. Then if you want to see a traditional Muslim perspective, there's a book titled The Sealed Nectar. These are the authentic sources of Islam. Read the biography of the Prophet and they have collected authentic information. Now what a lot of Christian missionaries do, again, they pick up a lot of this, a lot of this stuff from apocryphal, inauthentic, outright forgeries. And they tried to paint the Prophet of Islam. Uh, and the purpose is to confuse the masses. You know, put so much hatred against the Prophet out there so the Christians don't even consider uh, reading about the Prophet. He's just a barbarian. He's a warlord, someone who lived in the past and he committed atrocities. No need to read about him, right? This is the image that's painted. But once you start to read about him, okay, from authentic sources, you will see that the Muhammad you are being shown uh, uh, by... People out there, some people, is not the same Muhammad you will read about in these biographies. So wars of the Prophet of Islam were all for the defense of his community. And in some cases, it was preemptive. It was preemptive. Moses fought wars. Right? David fought wars. Solomon, the Israelite prophets, what were they doing? If Again, to point, it's not a red herring. It's directly relevant. If you believe in the Old Testament and its sanctity, and if you believe it's morally upright and it's good for teaching and correction, then you cannot, you cannot, you cannot use the same criticism for the Prophet of Islam for doing the same things, or to a lesser extent, by the way. Because in the Old Testament, we have massacres of children, animals. 
the Prophet of Islam never ever in his entire history commanded that. In fact, in the book of Bukhari, in the book of war, we read a statement, the Prophet came across uh, a dead body of a woman in the battlefield. He said, never, do not kill women and children, even in conflict, do not, do not. Only those who are fighting you, only those, and that's what the Quran says in chapter 2, verse 190, 191, 192. Read these verses and you will see the context. Thank you so much for listening. The very early one, the, the Battle of Badr, was because Muhammad set off with 315 men to attack uh, a caravan that was traveling from Damascus down to Mecca. It was guarded by 40 men, so Muhammad went and attacked it with his 300 men. They were, it, was a, it was basically highway robbery. They were trying to steal all the stuff that was from there. And then the Meccans heard about this and they sent 1,000 men to fight against Muhammad. So to say that they were all defensive is not correct. The Romans never threatened uh, Muhammad. They, they weren't concerned about him. Muhammad was a, a guy in the desert. Um, the Romans had all their own problems. They were fighting against the Persians. The Arabs were irrelevant. And that was because Muhammad actually attacked them with an army of 30,000 men. It was an offensive attack. The Romans were, were, were not threatening them at all. Anyway, they weren't concerned about them. Um, he mentioned about uh, women not being, um, uh, not being threatened there. And it's true. Women were killed. Oops, and I've run out of time. Um, yeah, but Muhammad didn't always speak uh, negatively against that. So this next question is for Bernie. Um, did the Bible mention Islam and or all Muhammad? And uh, related to that, uh, who was then the person mentioned uh, as the prophet coming out of Kedah? The Muslims claim that there are many prophecies about Muhammad in the Quran, uh, sorry, in the Bible. They list about 20 of them. And I've gone through, in fact, I did a debate here on this topic a couple of years ago, talking about uh, whether um, Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible. Um, are we up there? Yep. Good. Um, so th this was the com most common one that, that's referred to, and I've mentioned about that before, that doesn't fulfill there because Muhammad didn't obey Moses' law. They also talk about the Song of Solomon. There's one in Surah, uh, sorry, in chapter 5, 16, where it says, His mouth is sweetness, he is altogether lovely. And they point out that this word altogether lovely in Hebrew is Mahmadim. And they say this is the name of Muhammad. Well, if you look at uh, the rest of the references of Mahmadim, in, uh, in the Bible, you see it doesn't, it doesn't reply to Muhammad. It says, God says in Hosea, even if they bear children, I will, just, I will slay their Muhammads or their Mahmadim. Um, I'm about to take one of your Muhammads. Don't, do, not, do not lament. Um, the Mahmadines, God has slain all the Mahmadines, all the Muhammads who were pleasing to the, the eye. Um, God says that stronghold which you take pride in, the, your Muhammads, uh, the, the object of your, your affection, I'm going to desecrate them. If we look at the word in every other context, it's clear it does not refer to a person. It refers to the things that the people were pleased with. Um, and so it's a misuse of that passage. But I often hear people using that. Was there a second part to the question? Uh, who was uh, the person coming out of uh, Kedar? Yes, the person okay. mentioned um, in... Yeah, okay. Um, so if you look at that passage in, uh, in, um, in Isaiah 42, it says, all the tents of Kedar will praise him. We actually saw that happening on the day of Pentecost when there were Arabs present there at the, uh, um, when the, the, the gospel was first preached to the people of Jerusalem and they started responding to it and we've seen the Arabs continuing to turn to Jesus. I did not mention the prophecy in the Song of Solomon 15, of chapter 15, Muhammad did. So that was a red herring. <laughs> okay, what I want Bernie to talk about is Kedar and the Mount of Sela. Kedar is Arabia. It is clear no biblical scholar ever disputed that. It says, let the villages of Kedar lift up their voice. What? Bernie, the spin Bernie put on it, that Pentecost, the Arabs are rejoicing. No, it says, let the villages of Kedar uh, uh, rejoice. Let them lift up their voices. Let them sing a new song. The people who live by Mount Sela. This is, this. I mean, the Sela, the word Sela is clearly mentioned there. This is Medina, and this is clearly Arabia, where the Arabs are actually dwelling, where they live. 
So something is happening in Arabia with regards to that prophecy. Other things um, mentioned by Bernie, Badr, the Battle of Badr. Again, you're a PhD doctor and you, you are really embarrassing me when you mention these things in this way. The Battle of Badr was a response to the aggression of the Meccans when they took the shops of Abu Bakr in Mecca and they were raiding some of the, the cattle um, of the Muslims. So the Prophet of Islam, he wanted to respond to this aggression of the Meccans. So even the Battle of Badr, if you actually study the early history of it, how it happened, you will see that it was a response to the Meccan aggression. Again, Seal Nectar has the details. Thank you. Is uh, for both our speakers, and I guess we can allocate them both three minutes each, and they can decide, hopefully in a friendly manner, who will go first. <laughs> so the question is: Was Muhammad sinless? If he was not sinless, then can one be certain of salvation and of God's forgiveness just from doing good deeds and prayers? What does Jesus or Muhammad uh, offer that the other prophet does not? Okay, thank you for that question. Was Muhammad sinless? Uh, it depends how you define sin. If you mean by sinning uh, major sins, for example, lying, cheating, uh, deceiving, right? No, Muhammad was absolutely sinless in that case. Okay, if you're talking about human errors, of course, all prophets, all prophets were prone to make human errors. Jesus did that. Jesus, who was supposed to be God walking on earth, Okay, he is absolutely doing things that are not very pleasant. For example, cursing the tree, right? Or cursing the Pharisees. He, he was supposed to demonstrate better manners, right? If he's God in flesh, walking on earth, he was supposed to demonstrate better manners. But the New Testament tells us that he was speaking in very unpleasant language to those he did not like. For example, when a Gentile woman comes to him, he says, it is not for us to give the crumbs uh, that belong to the, sorry, give the bread that belongs to the Israelites to dogs, okay, referring to Gentiles, referring to Gentiles, non-Jewish people. So you, in other words, and don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen, this is what the New Testament states, and you can make, make of it what you like, okay? You are Gentiles. You are all Gentiles. Jesus never came for you. He clearly stated that I have never, I have not, I have not come for anyone but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The book of Matthew, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 24, Jesus categorically stated, I have come for no one. But in fact, he told his disciples, go you not into the house of the Gentile, rather go to the house of the Israelites, because that's, that's, what, uh, that's whom I'm come for. Those are the people I've come for. So Prophet Muhammad was sinless in the sense I mentioned, but he made human errors like other prophets, and he was corrected many times in the Quran. And this is how we know the Quran is the word of God, because the Quran corrected him many times. Many times the Quran put him right. So this is what the revelation is supposed to be doing, right? Revelation is from God. It is not from the prophet, right? So coming back to the issue um, of him being foretold in the Old Testament and uh, him being sinless, for example, he was um, told categorically by God, that you will be in paradise. When Bernie keeps mentioning this, I don't know what's going to happen to me, this was his humility. Just like Jesus, when he was asked uh, uh, about the hour, or when he said, Father is greater than I, okay, and all other things with, which the Christians claim, no, that was human Jesus speaking, the humble Jesus speaking. He was being humble. This was his humility when he said, Father is greater than I, right? This is how the prophets speak. They speak in a humble language. They don't inflate their, their ego. Rather, they humble themselves before God. So it was him speaking that, shall I not be a thankful servant to God? His wife, uh, when, she, when she saw him pray at night and his feet were swollen, she said to him, oh messenger of Allah, you are forgiven. You will be in paradise. Why do you pray like this? Why do you have to pray like this? And this is in Bukhari, by the way. This is in Bukhari. Authentic. Authentic source. Right? And the Prophet said, shall I not be a thankful servant of God? So if this was an imposter, an actor, a liar, a deceiver, why would he pray at night in his chamber alone, all night, until his feet were swollen? This is a true prophet of God who is doing in private what he does in public. In fact, he was doing more worship in private, testified to by his wives. His, who knows you more? Believe me, 
Your wives know you more than anyone else. They know. They know. When you sneeze, when you eat, and I'm not going to go into the details. <laughs> All right, the question was, um, was the prophet, was uh, Muhammad sinless? And I've said uh, clearly that I believe that he was because he said he was, and I gave the details for that. And you can see the, uh, uh, the pamphlet that we've got, two of them on uh, one one on Muhammad's uh, sins in the Quran, another one on Muhammad's sins in the, uh, in the Hadith. Um, can you be certain of salvation by good works? Muhammad said, um, no one will be saved by their good works. And they said, not even you. He said, not even me. Um, and I think that's really important. And Jesus, the, the, the teaching of the scripture is very clear. Salvation by good works is not, uh, not uh, um, a way forward at all. What does Jesus or Muhammad offer that the other one does not? Jesus offers the way of salvation. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. Muhammad, when he died, he died for his own sins, just like every one of us will. We will all die because of our sins. Muhammad, uh, Jesus died for the sins of others because he had no sins to, to die for. I just want to respond to um, two issues that uh, uh, Adnan has brought up um, one, and I'll, I'll probably get some extra time because he spoke over long, didn't he? Yeah. Um, uh, the um, this one he talked about cursing the fig tree, and I think it's an important one. Um, Muslims will often say, "Well, uh, why did Jesus curse the fig tree? It was not. It was a bad thing. The cursing of the fig tree was an act of prophetic symbolism. The Old Testament prophets all." carried out these actions the fig tree was a symbol of Israel and he said to the he told he prefigured this with a parable he talked about a man who had a fig tree and he went and he didn't find any fruit on it and he gave it more time to produce fruit and it did and he said if it doesn't we're going to cut it down and so the the temple that Jesus was going to was like the fig tree it was lacking good fruit it looked like it was flourishing it had lots of leaves but it was doomed its time was up and Jesus says Israel's time has passed. They've had their opportunity to respond to me um, as, the, as the Messiah, but now the new covenant is coming in. So I think it's important to understand, and Adnan rightly mentioned, that we need to uh, think about these things in their context. The second one was about um, Jesus and the Jews. Did Jesus come for the Jews only? Um, again, uh, the Jews were his initial focus, and we talked uh, uh, about that in Matthew 10, Matthew 15. Um, and that question about the, the woman, the Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus, Jesus did actually minister to this woman and he healed her daughter and he commended her faith. So to say he had nothing to do with Gentiles is, is not correct. We see him many times ministering to non-Jews. He sent out the 70. He dealt with the Samaritan woman who Adnan referred, referred to the other day. He healed a Samaritan leper. leper. He cast people, um, demons out of the, um, the man from Gadara. He he healed the Roman centurion's um, servants. Uh, the Roman centurion servant. He said, "I haven't found anyone with such faith as this centurion." Jesus had lots of dealings with uh, centuri with uh, with non-Jews, and his teaching included all nations. He said, "My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. I am the light of the world." Jesus was not specifically or only focused on the Jews. He talked about the gospel being proclaimed to the whole world being preached to the whole world as a witness and he said to his, his followers go and make disciples of all nations not just of the Jews he said you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth and us today are uh, a, test a testimony a witness to that when Jesus died, he died for the sins of the whole world. John said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through it. These, the, the Samaritan woman said, this man is the saviour of the world. Um, he said, my flesh is given for the life of the world. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. And Jesus has authority over all nations. He said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. He called, he's referred to as the true light who gives light to everyone. He says, the field is the world. This gospel will be preached to all nations. All nations will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And to him will be gathered all nations. So that promise in um, 
Acts, in Acts uh, on the day of Pentecost, we see the beginning of that. And the rest of the Bible and the rest of history is a testimony to that. That Jesus is the one who brings salvation to every nation. Thank you. Um, this next grouping of questions, I think, is um, uh, quite a, a number of you have uh, texted in. So I think it's uh, important to uh, cover it uh, for both our speakers again. Um, basically relating to what are the authentic and reliable uh, sources um, if Bernie's ones were not appropriate. And also um, a, a couple of people have uh, quoted uh, Hamza Yusuf, who have said that all hadiths are true and acceptable. So why, um, if Bernie has quoted some of them, that they were not acceptable? And also I think um, it would be good if both speakers could uh, tell us uh, from this question as well that putting Quran, Hadiths and Bible aside, um, are there any positive authentic books um, from authors of opposite faith um, that either of you would recommend to the audience today to continue our research on this important topic? Thank you for that. I thought the topic was Muhammad, a, Muslim, a Christian and Muslim perspective and Bernie did some preaching <laughs> near the end of his uh, last remark. But anyway, uh, so the sources. The sources of Muslims are the Quran, number one, primarily. And then how do you understand the Quran? You understand the Quran in the light of the prophetic tradition, which is called Hadith. And we have six main books of Hadith, and they are called Al-Bukhari, number one. Number two, Al-Muslim, number three is uh, an nisai and then we have Abu Dawud, and we have a Tirmazi, and then we have Ibn Majah. These six sources, six collections of reports from the Prophet of Islam or about him are the main sources of information, authentic information for us, the Muslims. And even in them, there are certain reports that are doubtful, but they are known to Muslim scholars because our system works very differently uh, to what the Christians have. The Gospels work differently. The Muslim tradition, uh, the, the, hadith of science, the science of hadith is a vast topic uh, and in order to study it, you will have to go back to scholarly books and see how it works. It is a very powerful tradition, well preserved and we know what is authentic. We do not attribute any false information to any prophet um, of Islam and we believe all the prophets were actually if, essentially preaching Islam. Islam is submission to God Almighty. This is why Jesus came. This is why Moses came. Jesus was not God. Moses was not God. Muhammad was not God. All of them were brothers in one faith. So this is all I had to say about that question. The sources are very important. And the books I want to recommend very quickly again, uh, Martin Ling's, his biography of the Prophet of Islam. Uh, then Seal Nectar is translated into the English language. You can find it. Then we have Karen Armstrong's. If you want a non-Muslim perspective on Prophet Muhammad, Karen Armstrong, he has written a biography of the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad. And there are many other works you can read. But look at objective scholars who have written books on these people. Right? If you will read from biased Christian missionaries, you will not get the truth. Likewise, if you want to read about Jesus Christ, don't read the bo a book written by a Muslim imam from a, from a mosque. I'm not saying he's going to be biased. I'm being very consistent because it is but natural for them to be biased, right? Read scholarly works. You want to read about Jesus? Giza Vermes. Giza Vermes, who is Jewish, no doubt. I mentioned him earlier. He has written a couple of books on Jesus Christ, right? Then there, are, there is, there is E.P. Sanders. There is a scholar called E.P. E. P. Sanders. James D.G. Dunn, another Christian scholar, um, who has written extensively on the life of Jesus Christ. And go and see what is authentic and what is not. The Gospels unfortunately, do not stand the test of time or the test of history. There are many inconsistencies in there. There is much in there that cannot be taken uh, as history. So my time is up. Thank you so much. And if you have any more questions about sources, do consult me later after the debate. Thank you. I thought the question was authentic and reliable sources for Islam. Was that right? Yeah. All right. So 
red herring, sorry, he started talking about the, the gospel sources and James Dunn and E.P. Sanders and whatever, liberal scholars, by the way, who most Muslims would not accept, or most Christians would not accept, and nor would most Muslims if we applied the same kind of categorization to uh, Islamic sources. Um, I'm interested that Adnan said he's quite happy for us to use Ibn Ishaq as a chronology, but not the content. How do you actually... Uh, pull those apart. How do you say, oh, well, these are the things happened in this order, but then we don't believe that they actually happened in the way that he described them? Mm. It doesn't quite uh, uh, come together. You've either got to have um, full confidence in, in a historian who's writing about things, and you think this person has done their research, they know that the things happened in this order, and they know what happened in those events. To say, oh, well, we'll accept the order, but we're not going to accept the events um, doesn't quite uh, fit together logically. You need to be more consistent than that. Either reject the whole lot, um, which you obviously haven't done because you've uh, said, you know, this is the place where we get our, you're telling your students, this is the place where we get our information, our chronology from, but, or um, accept it. Um, yeah, but you can't just say, we'll take these little bits and we'll reject the bits that we're, we're not offensive with, uh, are happy with. The other thing is that Ibn Ishaq is widely quoted by others. So Tabari, for example, relied on Ibn Ishaq. Um, there was a fair bit of um, kind of competition amongst the early uh, writers about Islam. They weren't happy with each other. Uh, if you see people like... Um, um, Abu Harera, for example, you know, they called him the guinea pig that came down from the mountains because they didn't like him. But he was... Night, that these events were all historically determined um, and we can see lots of Jewish, Roman, uh, Greek um, and Syrian scholars who all talk about the crucifixion as an historical event. Thank you. But now we come to the end where um, each speaker will have two minutes uh, to give their final summation and we will follow the same order with uh, Bernie first followed by Adnan. Well, today we've had a good opportunity to look at the life of Muhammad. The topic was who was Muhammad. And we saw that he had his strengths and his failings. Every person has their good points and their bad points. We, we should be clear about that. But what's unique about Muhammad was the claim and the claim of his followers that he is the best person who has ever lived, that he's the perfect model for humanity, that he's the final prophet of God. And I've shown you why I rejected all of these. We saw that Muhammad uh, suffered from some serious shortcomings in the, the ways that he carried out war, for example, his treatment of women and children uh, and the disabled treatment of his his enemies and we saw that this disqualified him as a, an intercessor on the day of judgment he had no certainty that he would enter paradise he said his good works would not save him and he could not save anyone else so he's in a sense in the same boat as every one of us on the day of judgment he will be standing there with the rest of us he can't help us and he can't harm us so where does that leave us we shouldn't finish with a, an imperfect model. And the one that I'm recommending to you, not surprisingly, is Jesus, the one who is the perfect model. He's the one who came, uh, lived in the flesh, and I'm off the topic. Yeah, uh, but you know where I stand. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being an amazing audience. Uh, I enjoyed the debate today. There was passion. There was, uh, um, there was a lot of criticism of each other, and we took it on uh, 
our cheeks, sorry, chins rather, <laughs> okay? Um, and I am, I'm really pleased to be here in Australia. It's an amazing country. I love Australia already. And we must continue in this spirit. Today we have again shown the world that Christians and Muslims can disagree immensely with each other on matters of faith and then, despite all that, come together as brothers and sisters in humanity and share their love with each other and have no hard feelings and go home thinking about what was discussed tonight. So please go home tonight, think hard about it. What I had to say, what Bernie had to say, Bernie's uh, trying his best to do his job, what he does, what I'm, I'm doing what I do, okay? But always, always give a sympathetic hearing to the other side. Never ever trust I'm talking to Muslims as well. Never ever take your own imams and teachers as the final source. Go to the Christians, talk to them, ask them why they believe in what they believe in and have sympathy for the Christians. Likewise, I want the Christians to go and read our sources sympathetically. Go to the authentic sources. There are 34,000 reports in the six books I mentioned. There's plenty there. The Prophet of Islam, who was he? He was a merciful man. We see a, a, an immensely merciful man. The Prophet said, the best of you who are best to your wives. And paradise lays under the feet of... Uh, Bernie kept mentioning women, women, women. Of course, rhetoric is very powerful in a debate. But the reality is, Prophet Muhammad taught, paradise is under the feet of your mothers. Your women are a trust of God in your hands. Be kind to them. The Quran chapter 4 verse 19 states... Live with them with generosity and compassion. And some people have an audacity to come and say that Prophet Muhammad had all these unpleasant things. And same goes for war and other accusations against him. Believe me, you want to study the man, study him from authentic sources of Islam and you will see a completely different, compassionate, generous, loving, upright, moral man. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Good on you. That is great. Thank you. Once again, I echo um, Mr. Anand Rashid's words. You have been an amazing audience. Thank you for your patience, for your participation, um, and I, I'm sure you have all enjoyed yourself listening to these uh, two world-class debaters. Please join me in thanking Dr. Bernie Power and Mr. Anand Rashid. <laughs>